Good morning, and, and thanks to those of you uh, that are joining us streaming. Um, so, my name is James McKenna. I am the unit lead for the Inclusive Design Unit at the Los Angeles County Office of Education. Uh, my background is in both general and special education. I have a social science credential and a mild to moderate special ed credential. Most of my background though is working with students, diploma bond students with uh, emotional disturbance and high functioning autism. Um, I did my graduate work around ed leadership and ed psychology, so how we learn and what motivates us, and that's what really drove me into, into focusing a lot of my work around universal design for learning. Um, and I'm very happy to be here uh, with you folks. I know p I, how, how far people have to come. I, I had to fly up from Los Angeles. Anyone come further than that? Redlands, okay. Yeah, and we all, where was that? Santa Ana. Santa Ana, okay. Yeah, and I, I had to leave my wife and the, and the two little ones at home, so, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be here. But, uh, yeah, uh, a little bit more about me. I'm an avid runner, uh, so you hear some, some running analogies in there. Um, uh, hopeful, uh, hopeless Star Wars geek. And uh, I'm originally from Boston, Massachusetts, so go Red Sox. Yeah. Ooh. And when I say Boston, I'm from Revere, oh, we got Revere, which is um, right on the subway. It's not like one of those things where you say, oh, I'm from San Francisco. Where? Sonoma? No, not quite the same thing. So I've got some goals for, for this presentation, um, and I'm also going to ask you to set some goals. But starting out, these are my goals for you. So we're going to look at all the challenges there are for implementing training and, and how we can, not just UDL, but, but other things, and how we can use universal design for learning in our professional development and workplace learning. And I'd like you to, to set a goal uh, about how you can connect with someone else in the room or with me or on how you can uh, drive UDL implementation uh, in your area. So take a minute, think about this, and set a goal for yourself. You can just keep it to yourself. You can write it down. You can share it with a, a near peer. But I've told you what I'm hoping to do, so I don't know what you came expecting. <laughs> but I hope to help everybody get out of this what they need whether it's during the session or after the session. So if we're going to meet those learning goals, there are some things we're going to need to do. The first thing we need to do is be present. And I, I don't mean just physically, but mentally focused. It's hard. It's the first thing you're doing uh, coming in here. You're just right after having a nice breakfast. Um, but be present. Um, and set yourself up for success. I put my phone in airplane mode, so I'm not getting little buzzes in the watch and saying, oh, wait, whatever. Um, and I move around a lot, so it won't start telling me, you need to move. I also want you to participate. So if you're the, when we have time to have some discussion, if you're the type of person that likes to just lean back and listen, think about leaning in a little bit and offering some ideas and some questions, and vice versa. If you're the one who tends to, to lean in and really jump into discussion, make sure you're leaving room for others. Uh, and finally, be a problem solver. And we're going to start off talking about <laughs> challenges. 
And sometimes, depending on, on your mood or your, your experiences or your circumstances, it can be hard looking at things and it's easier, I say, to find problems with solutions than solutions to problems. But we're going to focus on, you know, looking at things with new eyes and how can we ch tackle some of those pernicious challenges that we have. So based on those, also set yourself a self-regulation goal. Say, okay, what am I going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn my phone off, or I'm going to make sure I do I listen to two people before I talk, or whatever else that is. And you, again, you can share that goal, or you can keep it to yourself, but usually if we share them or we write them down, we're more likely to keep them. We're going to frame this presentation around the, this three-headed challenge. Does anybody know what this thing is? This handsome, handsome thing? It's a, it's a beast from Greek myth called the Chimera. So the Chimera was a three-headed demon that was thought to be indomitable. Thought to be, until someone figured out what to do. It had the head of a a goat, a lion, and a dragon, or a serpent. Um, but when we're looking at how we can improve workplace learning, there's three big areas that are, are challenges. One is that there are three phases of workplace learning, and we'll talk about those first. Then there's the variability among all our learners, which is, you know, that's what UDL is all about, but we have to acknowledge that for adults, not just for kids. And then the design constraints that we're all working under because, you know, it's easy to say, well, in a perfect world, I would do this. But since we don't live in a perfect world, what are we going to do? I'm going to start off talking with this idea of three phases of workplace learning. So really, there are three areas where we learn at work, and they're interrelated. But there's a, the formal training environment, whether it's a workshop session, an all-day training, an online module, a PLC, that is sort of, that's what we, we look at as, as a formal training environment. And that's typically what we focus on when we think about professional development. And then what's you know, increasing in emphasis is the, uh, the coaching and the mentoring aspect of workplace learning. In, in uh, business, they call this the social phase of learning, through coaching and mentoring, which, whether it's a formal mentoring relationship or an informal one, where a colleague just guides you through a process or a new idea. And then there's the third piece, which is the learning that happens when we apply things doing the hard work of the job. What did we learn when we actually try to put things in practice, and what strategies did we come up with, workarounds, what did we do? And that's one that tends to get overlooked, in my experience, when we, when we send folks out to, well, I sent them to training, but then what? Okay? What happens? How many of you have been sent to training and then came back and nobody else even knew what you went to? Yeah. So in the business world, there's this guideline somewhat controversial guideline called the 70-20-10 rule. And it's about the percentage of learning that happens in each of those three environments. So in one of those environments is where 70% of the learning happens, one of them is where 20% and one is where 10% where happens. So raise your hand if you think the 70% happens in the training environment, in the formal training environment. Okay, nobody here, uh, and I'm not writing these down anyway, and hopefully the, f the folks watching at a distance have had their ideas in. How many think about coaching? Okay, coaching. 
So three people in the room. So I guess the default would be that the bulk of the learning happens doing the hard work. And yeah, that's basically the way that goes. Now, I said it's controversial because people look at it and say, well, no research ever breaks down into nice, even deciles, OK? 70%, 20%, 10%. And that when they originally did this research, it was, it was primarily f uh, with a, a, a mostly male sample size. And when they recreated it, the percentages were different. They were like, I don't know, 55, 40, and 5. But I don't really care what the percentages are. It's important that we realize that learning happens in all three of these areas, and if we ignore one, it's at the, to the detriment of the others, okay? It's a breakdown in the system. And in any one of these cases, we agree that most of the learning happens when we're doing the hard work. So how do we support that if that's where more, we want people to learn things and put them into practice. So how do we, how do we support where that actually happens? And really, none of these ratios are going to be exact for everybody. But it's important to know that most of it happens there. So if you're a teacher or a trainer, raise your hand. OK. Now, raise your hand if you like having your time wasted. Yeah. <laughs> no. None of us do. Shocking. But we have to think about that in a learning environment. How do we not have our time wasted? Because some of the traditional things we do lead to wasting time, OK? Lead to wasted time, both for us and for the people that we're trying to teach. So it's a tale of two curves. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have heard of the learning curve, OK? We use it in common everyday vernacular. Oh, it's a steep learning curve. Well, in a, in a formal training environment, the learning curve looks like this. You first start off like, what the heck is this? I don't know what this is. Oh, I start to see it. I make connections to my own practice. And then I really drive in. And now I'm ready to go and go do something with it. If we do all, if it's a good quality training and we're checking for understanding, keeping people involved, and making sure they find it relevant to their own practice. That's all well and good. But it has a partner called the forgetting curve. And this is not a new thing. They came out with them at the same time. A guy named Ebbinghaus came up with these in 1885. It's just we focus on the first one, because the second one's where the real kicker is. And these are, these are nice curves, because what we know is about 70% of what we do here is lost by the next day if we don't do something about it. Okay, All things being equal, you spend all day with a group of teachers. And unless there's a f some sort of follow-up, 70% of it is gone the next day. Follow-up by you or follow-up by them. You know, if we leave them with some static resources, some handouts, some things, if that doesn't go right in the circular file, they have some time to practice. But it's trying to remember, wait, what was that thing they talked about again? I don't have that in my notes. It's hard for them to go back and review. And if they don't have someone else at their side, if they're the only one who went to that training, there's no one really for them to talk to unless we, we give them connections. And that's a big challenge because, oh, and if our workplace doesn't support it, so if we're not being coached or our, our bosses don't expect it, support it, you know, get in the, if they get in the way of it because they don't know what we're trying to do, then we lose it. After a month, it's pretty much gone. Now, we can't foolproof this, but there are some things that we can do. So if we leave them with some job aids, with some specific things that they can do after training, and maybe touch base with some reminders and put them in touch with some resources, it can start to go up. If they receive some coaching specific to what they're doing, it can go up further. If they get support from their managers to really implement the learning, it can go up further and further. And that's what we'd really want. You know, We spend a lot of time and money on training. And this is what we'd really want, is for that to go out and see those behaviors in place and to, to get that performance improvement. But sadly, we, we spend a lot of time looking at just this part. So that's. That's one of the big pieces, is how do we incorporate 
all three phases into our professional development. So I'd like you to take a minute and reflect on what you do right now to facilitate the use of learning on the job. What do you do in your current role that helps them, helps the, your, your trainers or your trainees to actually put things into practice once they leave your training? Or the trainings to which you send them? And feel free to have a table discussion, discuss with a near peer. We'll come back in about two minutes. Hi, camera guy. This is my good side right here. <laughs> yeah, you, can, you can do blue steel. I'm going to ask people to share. Bring you back together in 20 seconds. <laughs> if I can bring you back in five, four, three, two, I feel bad the cameraman's back there, he's going back and forth. I'm going to try and stay in my box, but I get excited. <laughs> so any ahas, thoughts, reactions about this uh, that you're willing to share? And, and, and please wait for the microphone. Anybody? So I have one example in our projects. Uh, we do statewide grant work. And we're actually working with James here. Um, and we are going to be offering a North Central South couple day training. And so after our, our grantees go to that, then we have assigned kind of coaches or facilitators in their region that will follow up and say, okay, what did you learn? How can we help you apply that? What other additional resources or supports might you need? I saw the list of attendees. You had three or four folks from your district. How can we then follow up and help you? So that other people even outside their organization are checking in to see if they need supports to, to apply what they learned. Okay, and your participants, some of them are in the management area. Okay. Anybody else? It's good to seed the room with friendly faces. <laughs> so one of the creative opportunities that came out was use the students. So even in daily announcements, they're asking the students to use the language, so it's kind of seeping into the culture, so it's a constant reinforcement on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Great. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. 
So that's our, our first big bucket of challenge, is, is dealing with learning across the spectrum of, of environments. The next one is thinking about learner variability. You know, we've, Universal Design for Learning has been around for decades, and we primarily think about it from a student perspective. I say primarily because there's a few people who have talked about it, but we can't tell teachers that they need to be flexible and provide supporting and learning environments while only offering them one way to learn as a solid group, okay? Because this is really what UDL is all about, that one size does not fit all. Now, I don't, I don't mean to, by this, it doesn't, I'm not disparaging individuality by calling it a, a challenge, but it does make us rethink how we do lots of our, our, our learning at work. Now, when we're thinking about our educators, what are some of the ways in which they differ from how they learn? So have table talk about how your educators might differ in the ways that we learn, and then we'll solicit some ideas, okay? And I'll show you some of the things that I've, I've come up with. Forgetfully, I can only give you about 30 more seconds. I know we could talk about this all day. And if I can bring everybody back in five, four, three, two, one. So, uh, and, and refrain from calling out too fast because we're gonna have the microphone come around. I'd like to get four or five ideas from the audience on the ways, just give me one way that our educators differ in the way that they learn. Okay, um, we were talking at our table Every educator brings their own background of experiences, things that they've felt are successful and their comfort level with their abilities. Okay. So their, their prior knowledge as well as their beliefs. Okay. Another one. Over here. I heard convos. I was ear hustling. We work with um, LACO with Steve Dorsey with mm -hmm. camps and juvenile halls and he said, why don't we use MTSS for teachers? So mm -hmm. tier one is our classroom edition, tier two is more sophisticated stuff, and then tier three is content mm -hmm. specific for peers. Okay, so we might need some differentiation. And even that tier one, it would be better if it was universally designed, right? Anybody else? We need to find a way to make it relevant to their daily lives um, mm -hmm. and motivate adult learners in a different way than we would possibly motivate our students. Yeah. What a, I mean, a lot of the, the, the principles of, of UDL apply to people, not just kids. But frankly, we get away with more with kids, right? You know, we want to make it relevant for kids too, but sometimes, but the teachers say, how is this one, not one more thing? How is this going to help me do the hard work that I do? Show me something that I can do that's going to make my life at least, if not easier, at least not more difficult, okay? So I've got some that I wanted to, to, to share along with the ones that you folks came up with. There are folks that are, that are comfortable with online learning, okay? That are comfortable learning in a digital environment, okay? And then, and their feelings about online learning. Then there are people that 
have feeling, they have feelings about in-person training, okay, whether they, they like it or hate it or are indifferent to it. Then there's people that are more comfortable working in collaboration with others versus people that would prefer to work solo. Just tell me what I need to do and leave me alone, okay? We also have to think about the roles that people play. You know, when we're, we're thinking about implementing something challenging like universal design for learning or PBIS or RTI or whatever else it is, we have to think about, well, not just how does that look like from a teacher's perspective, let alone all the developmental levels, but what does that look like from a coaching perspective? What does that look like from an administrative perspective? What does it look like from site leadership to district leadership? Then we have to think about their, their prior knowledge and their ability to process some new things. We don't want to overwhelm people, but we do want to keep them engaged. And then we want to make sure that they can find a myriad of applications for what we're trying to teach them instead of saying, you just do this. We spent a long time in education trying to teacher-proof things. You do the software, or you read out of the book, and when I leave this room and I hear one sentence started, I get to the next room and I hear it finished. What's that do to people's autonomy? No. They want to be acknowledged for their expertise and their experience to do the things, to do the good work that they know how to do and be helped to enhance it, okay? So that's the second big bucket, is thinking about all the different learners that we have. And the last one is, is design constraints, which when I, I took my position, my, my title is I'm the coordinator of inclusive design. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about some of my design constraints, and that was the first thing that hit me in the face long before I really started thinking about learner variability um, or the phases of workplace learning. It was just the sheer scope of what we try to do when we try to implement something in a classroom or a school or a district or in a county or a state. So my office is in Downey in Los Angeles County. And, oh, I got a fist pump down there, okay? <laughs> so like many folks across the state, I have these big design constraints when it comes to designing training. LA County is 4,700 square miles, okay? I was originally hired as, as the consultant of special education. Okay, James, one guy, 4,700 square miles, 80 school districts, over 350 charters. This doesn't include our own internal LACO programs about one and a half million kids. So what are you going to do? So then you got to get creative. So the first thing I thought of was, okay, what's, what, what are some of, the, what are some of the, uh, the big picture items I could do, but also how can I work harder, how could I work smarter, not harder? And I was, I'm working pretty hard, but how can I make that work to, to sort of, as we say in our office, move the needle? It's, it's a great opportunity. I mean, having the opportunity to get out of bed and help one kid, 10 kids, 1.5 million kids, like, that'll, that'll get you going to work <laughs> if, you, if it's not overwhelming, okay? Another design constraint is the cost of training, okay? A clientele looks at it and say, well, you know, it's going to cost us how much to get a substitute teacher, if we can find substitutes. So, and then there's the registration fees. So we have fees associated with materials, whether or not we have food, repro materials. In, in LA County, we have some great conference spaces, but we do a lot of training. So it, you have to reserve rooms a year in advance. So often we're finding outside places in which to train, which comes with a cost. Oh, it's you know, 40 bucks a head built into the cost of training, and we have to pass that on because we don't have the sheer you know, budget to do that unless we had big grant funds. And then you, you think about the, they have the mileage cost, okay, of sending people out to training. I told you, 4,700 square miles. In LA, you joke, people come visit and they say, how far is it to Hollywood? And I say, what time do you want to get there? <laughs> because we don't measure it in mileage, we measure it in traffic. We have, anybody get Friday morning light out here? 
We have that in LA, at least on my commute, and I don't understand it because it's light on the way to work, but it's still heavy on the way home. Like, do people sleep in and then they go? I don't, I don't know. But mileage is a big deal. So we have to figure out how are we going to, to battle this beast. This is Bella Rafana, who, who was the, the mythical hero who actually figured out how to beat the chimera. So the first thing when thinking about how do I, my, my first charge is looking at improving outcomes for students with disabilities, how am I going to move that lever? And I quickly sort of set my sights on universal design for learning. Like I said, I, I, um, my background, my doctorate degree is in ed leadership and ed psych. So how we learn and what motivates us. I graduated on a Thursday. I got hired for this job on a Friday. It started a couple weeks later and were, was faced with that. And I had heard about UDL in my teacher training programs, but it was just sort of mentioned. There was a little wheel thing that I was, but I didn't really see what it was about. And it certainly wasn't supported and it wasn't talked about among my peers. But it came forward through some events at our, at our county office. And I took a look at it and I said, well, there's all the stuff. I just spent three years looking at the information processing system and expectancy value theory and all these, and self-regulation and all these things. And there it is. This actually puts the stuff into practice. And what I knew was, and many of you know, will probably know this, that it's not based on what works for students with disabilities, it's what works for everybody. So now we can do something that, under the guise of students with disabilities, we can actually help everybody. This is a big opportunity, but it, again, a daunting one, 1.5 million kids. So for those of you that maybe aren't familiar, we, we don't have time to do a deep dive in, into UDL, but let's just say it's, it, it's a framework for overcoming barriers to learning and providing kids options and pathways to, to reaching both yours and their learning goals, okay? And it's, it's based, deeply based in the research. So, it comes to us from the Center for Applied Special Technology, or CAST. Yet another acronym. I put, this, I put this in a course that we did, and someone said, why do we need access to the California science test? I said, no, no. Uh, let's, James, spell it out first, then use the acronym. OK, lesson learned. Um, it's based on the neuroscience of, of how we learn and what motivates us. And it, what I love about it is that it's iterative. So the, the guidelines get revised periodically as we learn more and more about, about these things. Um, when Common Core came out, it was endorsed as best practice for tier one. Not tier two or tier three, but tier one. And among other places, it's written into the Every Student Succeeds Act that we should be providing universal design learning opportunities for our students. It's also in our California Special Ed Task Force report that came out in 2015, like right before I took my job, that said we should be implementing evidence-based uh, classroom and school-wide practices, including UDL. It's in the Higher ed, Op Higher ed Opportunity Act. So it says if a college or teacher induction program wants federal grant money, they need to teach folks about UDL. So you have a copy of the guidelines. And uh, since we're all digital, I'm going to show you something that we use in, in our coursework. And it's just a quick video on how to read these. And you'll hear a very suppressed Boston accent throughout this video. Or maybe not suppressed. Let's look at how the UDL guidelines are laid out and how you should approach implementing them in your instruction. First, there are three principles. Starting from the left, we have provide multiple means of engagement, laid out in green. Next, in purple, is provide multiple means of representation. Finally, in blue, is the last principle, provide multiple means of action and expression. The goal for each principle can be found at the bottom of each column. Now, within each principle are three blocks. These are guidelines, which are supported by individual checkpoints. All right, those are the three layers of information, principles, guidelines, and checkpoints. But where do you start? Well, the UDL principles are not given a hierarchy. 
Engagement doesn't outrank action and expression, but they are laid out in the progression of a typical lesson. You begin by engaging the students, then you introduce the content and skills required by your learning objectives, and then they perform some activity to produce evidence of having learned the content or skill. Granted, that's overly simplistic, but you get the point. There's not a slide for that, but as we, uh, we're setting up to do work on UDL, is it? It, and I'll talk later about some of the things we're doing. I figured it'd be good to show it. So there are three sayings I use around, um, around UDL when we're thinking about implementing it, whether it's from the teacher perspective, the school, or the district. And the first thing is this, and I told you there was going to be a running analogy. It's a marathon, not a sprint. No one should look at these guidelines and say, I have to implement all this tomorrow. Or my teachers need to be doing this by next week, okay? It's a marathon, not a sprint. And moreover, um, oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a lens, not a checklist. It's not about just going around click, 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 click. It's about thinking about, okay, how, do my, how are my learners going to vary when it comes to the way that they need to be engaged around this content? Their, their supports for their capabilities for self-regulation and the ways that they're going to receive the content and how they're going to connect to it and apply it to their prior knowledge and also their, their experience. And then thinking about how they're going to interact with it and do something with it and, align, and generate goals and monitor their own progress. Okay, how am I going to support that? Where am I going to see variability? Because I'm going to. We already predicted some in this room. Okay, we already predicted you know, big areas where there's going to be variability. So how do we plan for that ahead of time, okay, instead of having to go back and retrofit and do intervention? And the last one, it's a journey, not, not a destination. Um, raise your hand if you've seen uh, Novak and Re Rodriguez's uh, UDL progression rubric. Anybody see that? Uh, if you haven't, uh, you'll see links to a Padlet. We have it on there, or you can just look up UDL progression rubric. It's wonderful, and one of the wonderful things about it is that it starts off with emerging, then goes proficient, and the third column is progressing towards expert practice. It doesn't say mastery, okay? You're never done, okay? The person who says, oh, I already do all that, that's the person that needs to take a step back and really look at what they're doing, okay? It's a journey, not a destination, including for those of us that are trying to apply it into our professional development. I'm not gonna tell you that everything I've done is perfectly universally designed, including this presentation, but I am constantly working at that to improve it, okay? So let's think a little bit about what universal design for learning could look like in the three phrases and, and how we could begin to apply it. And I say begin because, again, universal design for learning is a journey, and two, we don't really have the time to dive into stuff, okay? So this is the first guideline, recruiting uh, providing options for recruiting interest. This is in, in the principle of engagement, okay? And so the checkpoints for optimizing individual choice and autonomy. Well, one thing I could do is give the people a choice in the delivery of the professional development. How could I give them options and how they meet that learning goal? Because my goal is not that they attend a training. My goal is that they put these behaviors into practice, right? It's not the goal that they make it out to Downey and back the same. I mean, I want them to, be, to show up, but it's how do they put the work into practice? That's my ultimate goal. It's not about doing it one way to get there. But we do plenty of one size fits all, especially when it comes to the adults. Someone brought it up earlier. How do we make it authentic to their practice? Okay? How can we connect it to what they're actually doing in the classroom to solve the problems that they have right now? Okay? And give them opportunities to pra practice that. And then how do we do that in an environment that's safe to try new things? 
One thing you do is, is set norms. And when I do in-person professional development, um, I really try to avoid gotcha questions. I tell people if I ask a gotcha question, say, don't do that, James. And I also tell them that I'm going to make the most mistakes through the day and they're going to be the most public. So, you know, just relax. It's okay. Let's just try some things. So we try to address the fact that there might be some anxiety and just lower that filter so that uh, it's a safe place to, to learn and, and to talk about challenges. One of my colleagues, a great trainer, used to call it Vegas rules. You know, what happens in the training room stays in the training room and we, we're going to have an honest conversation about how tough the work is and what we're going to do about it, okay? Yes? So what have you found to be a good response when folks are feeling that threat, um, even of attending UDL? So we find that out in the field that some folks are saying, well, it feels like a new initiative. It feels like this is going to be one more thing. How, what have you found has been you know, kind of a really good way to engage with folks who you know are, are entering on that journey but are feeling mm -hmm. like it's going to be another thing, right? It's not going away. Okay. <laughs> right, but, um, right. The way I structure a lot of my in-person, thank you for the question, is I, we just start with why. Like, what are we trying to do here? And then I move into how and just thinking, building some little agreements on, along the way about how we learn and what motivates us long before we ever get to UDL. And people talk about you know, what they understand about cognitive load or multitasking or how, how we motivate people to do things. And then finally, and we build agreements along the way, then we get to this UDL thing and we connect it back to what we already talked about to say, oh, this is not a new thing. It's putting things that we understand into practice in an organized way. And then we acknowledge you know, that, I'll hold up my handout, this can be pretty overwhelming at first. Like there's colors and there's checkpoints and there's all this stuff. And I just hammer home through the day that this is a journey, not a destination. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Let's just talk about one little piece. And we take time to, to think about what they're already doing and tie it to here to find homes for the strategies that they already know to say that this is not a wholesale reinvention of your teaching. It's a way to do your teaching with the intent the specific intent to address the barriers in your classroom, okay? But we have to acknowledge that this is, this is overwhelming, or it can be. And so uh, not only do I hammer that home with, with, with the teachers, but also with the administrators. Do not tell your teachers that they should be, I tell them from the beginning, you are not going to leave here an expert in UDL. I just hope you leave here interested, and here are some supports if you're interested to go learn further, okay? So through coaching, we'll think about that second guideline for effort and persistence. Highlight, this is one thing, what do you mean by salience of goals? Like what are we really trying to achieve? And what I like to do with folks is say, what would that look like if we got it right? Okay? What would that look like if we got it right? And start backwards designing from there. Instead of saying, I'm stuck here and I don't know how to get to the next step, we start backwards planning from there. What would that look like? if we did it, okay? Which also makes it, can make it less daunting if we can build out a path, but also grounds them in, why am I doing this hard work in the first place? What's the point of it? And how many of you do coaching? Yeah, they're not all the same. So we need to go in there with a toolbox and say, here are some different supports that you can try, okay? And whether it's, like with Universal Design for Learning, and I sit down with the teachers, I don't say you have to use this one tool to design your lesson plans. Here are some different ones that might work for you. Here are some different ways that you can use it. UDL Exchange, for example, has a wonderful lesson builder with all kinds of scaffolds. But what we tell people is you don't have to use that template if you don't want to. You don't have to build your lesson in there. But if you want to think about goals from a universally designed perspective, this is a good place to get some support. If you want to think about the barriers, if you want to think about how you can implement places, these are places where there are scaffolds. But you still have the choice to write the lesson in whatever template you, you want to or sometimes need to. Sometimes places say, we all write it in this perspective, whether it's a software or whatever else it is. Then how can we foster collaborative learning within the school environment? You know, it's a lot, it can be a lot safer to learn with our peers, you know? and foster collaboration, so give, even just a learning pair that you can go through this together. 
you know, and there has to be a relationship there. And maybe part of that coach is finding who's going to be the right person for this. You know, what is that right marriage of, of communication styles and, and, and uh, beliefs about, about learning that's going to work? And then mastery-oriented feedback. That's what coaching is all about. This is what works. Here's an area of opportunity. Did you con could you consider doing this specific thing and trying that out and seeing how that works? Everybody likes great job, but that great job needs to be followed up with actionable stuff. And then in the work phase for managers, we're thinking about how do we support self-regulation because that's when we're on our own doing our work. Well, how can we have SMART goals that are aligned to actually implementing the things that we say are important? How can we build that into the goal, okay? How can we visibly support, because people brought it up with teachers, like it can be overwhelming. You think I'm gonna do this overnight. No, I don't. And he, but here's how I'm gonna support you. A lot of times we lay out expectations without supports. And what I tell managers, you can't have any expectations you don't support. It's not fair to kids, it's not fair to grown-ups. And then how do we check in with them? What's the progress? What is that looking like? How do we get them to reflect? How do we give them models, other places that can, they can go look? You know, down the hall, Steve did a great job last week. Why don't you have him you know, share that with you? Or he's doing part two tomorrow. Maybe we can work out a way for you to go see that. I'm working with a charter school and they've been taping themselves and then getting together and talking about it. And so the, the administrator just checks in with them, you know, how's that going? And makes space for them to do that and facilitates that. If you want to learn more about universal design for learning, these are two of the many books. Um, this is a great book for teachers, but it also has a lot of embedded um, questions and reflections for a book study. So it's a great book to provide teachers for doing a book study. Uh, it's by Katie Novak. She also co-wrote a book called Universally Designed Leadership, which speaks specifically about applying UDL to professional development, among other things, you know, from a site and district leadership perspective. The other one is Liz Berkowitz's uh, UDL Moving from Exploration to Integration. It's looking at that whole phase of UDL implementation, including how do we universally design supports for teachers. I'm writing one too, but we're about a year away from that one. <laughs> um, there are some more just quick start strategies in the Padlet. Um, this is a direct link here. Also, you can go to udla.laco.edu, and it's one of the supports that we put up there. And I'll show you that website in a bit. But there's just some quick little ideas that you can try to start implementing things. So when you go into the Padlet, there are different columns, and you'll see this one for professional development. So we talked about the barriers, and we talked about some strategies, some ideas how we might do that. So then how do we get support to do that? And so now I'm going to lay out some of the supports that, some of the supports that we've built, and you know, some of the opportunities we'd like to have to work with other folks around the state and the country to, to move this forward. Because again, starting one guy, <laughs> what are we going to do? So two years ago, it's fitting that this is a Thursday, so I can say throwback Thursday. So two years ago, I go to my boss, Dr. Contreras, and I say, you know, I want to, to build out some professional development for UDL, and I want to do it in an MTSS format. I want to do it in a multi-tiered way. I'm also one of the county leads for, for some, so I spent a lot of time looking at MTSS. It's like, how do we do this in a differentiated way to support things? So we had this goal, which is great, James. Th this, is, this is a good goal for you, and what do you need? I will said, well, the first thing, I need time and a mandate. 
because there were people th that believed that my job was to create a whole lot of one-offs. So here's one day of strategies to support ADHD, and here's one day for autism, or here's a two-day on this. Well, those are all well and good, but you know, from my perspective, looking at the, the challenges that we have, I said, how do we, how do we reach more students, okay? And how do I, does one person look at, at moving the lever? And I still bring in folks to do those things, and I build our capacity to do that. So we started the Universal Design for Learning Academy. I wish I came up with this. I didn't. I, I heard it at the UDL conference in August, and I said, that's it. That's what we're trying to do. We don't change the learner. We change the learning, OK? Let's shift that idea that if they didn't get it, it's the teacher's fault, or the, the, the principal's fault, or the student's fault. But I started, my unit was called uh, from Curriculum Instruction Services Special Education. I said, boss, this isn't a special ed thing. And if I go around with all this UDL stuff, people are going to say, oh, it's this, oh, this is a special ed thing. I'm going to send my special ed director. I'm going to send my special ed teachers. But it's not. So I think we need to change the name. And she said, yeah, we'll change the name. So we came up with inclusive design. We're looking at inclusive pr practices and universal design, inclusive design, uh, which means I go down in, because I was the first consultant of special ed they ever had, and now I'm the last one, which means I am the greatest consultant of special education <laughs> that the Los Angeles County Office of Ed has ever, ever had. It's, it's not an old joke to a new audience. So let's think about those, some of those um, design constraints. So I have time and a mandate, but now I have to deal with capacity and geography and cost. So one of the things we quickly learned is, well, we need to do more things with online learning. So we started two years ago working with our Center for Distance and Online Learning, building out a self-paced eight-module course for implementing universal design for learning. Uses a lot of those videos like I showed you uh, and automatically assess quizzes because, you know, for a moderated course, there's only one guy. I can't moderate for the sheer number of teachers I need to train. So it needed to be self-paced and needed to be automatic. And we give tips for transfer. And I'll show you where you can look at some of that stuff. We said, well, some people are going to want a more facilitated online experience. So we took that content and we built it out and made graduate level co courses for teachers where they take the same content, but then they start writing lesson plans and submitting them and calling out where they've implemented universal design for learning checkpoints. And then they get mastery oriented feedback on how that's going and, and actionable ideas on where to go further. And by the end, they've written two universally designed lessons and, and have goals for their implementation. But what about the coaches and the admins? So then we look at a lot of the same content from a different perspective. How do you support a teacher? And so they, they're doing uh, a lot of different discussions and pieces, but they're also submitting lessons from teachers that they supervise and calling out where they're seeing things and writing out what is the mastery-oriented feedback that they're giving to that teacher. And then we give feedback on that. And by the end, rather than writing lesson plans, their, their assignment is to collabor collaboratively develop SMART goals for UDL implementation in that classroom. Um, we're piling both of these right now, and so they're going to launch in the spring, and they're, right now they're, be, they're in front of UCLA to get um, evaluated for extended ed credit so that someone could go on there. If they need to graduate credits, they could pay UCLA, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks, and they could get credits out of it as well. And then what we started a year and a half ago is a blended cohort. So how do we drive UDL implementation at the site level? So I'm working with eight schools across LA County, and we meet with site leadership teams. We meet with the coaches. Right now, we're piloting among you know a select group of teachers. And last year, we spent time talking about who those pilot teachers should be, what type of teachers did they want to recruit, and so our plan is to next year help them go to scale, and then and then use that uh, to to offer a more wide open offering. But as one person, you can't, I, I lied. I, I'm actually a unit of 1.4. I have 40% of a secretary, but I kind of say we're two people because she gives me like super awesome uh, help. 
So I partnered with the Center for Distance and Online Learning at LACO to help build some of the, the modules. Um, and then, as a county lead, I looked at this, this big statewide project, the SUMS grant, and said, wow, they've got connections all over the state. And so I reached out to the wonderful folks at Orange County, and it seemed to me that there's like one or two lone nuts in every county office that's thinking about UDL. You know, luckily, I get to spend most of my time looking at it. A lot of these folks are just looking at it among five other things. And I said, hey, you've got, a, you've got contacts at every county office. What if we started a statewide network around UDL implementation? And so we did that through the SUMS grant, okay? And if you're not part of it and you want to be, you've got my card. And we've met, tw we meet every couple months online. I'm hosting the next one in December. And we just share some of the things that we're doing. We share resources. We, we, do, we put out announcements, things like that, to start connecting the dots because you know, if we're going to do this, one person can't do it by themselves. And it seemed to me like a lot of people were trying to do it all by themselves. So how do we work smarter, not harder? It's one of the beautiful things about learning design. And I had this conversation with Sung Park. If you haven't met Sung, he's, he's a great person up here in Santa Clara County. And he was sharing some of the work he's doing around courses on behavior. I said, I love that you're writing courses on behavior because now I don't have to. I can direct them to yours. He's like, yeah, and I don't have to write a course on UDL because there are other courses, yours or other ones from CAST, that they can go to. We don't need to reinvent that wheel. We just need to help people connect all the dots and find all the resources, OK? And then we're partnering with the su Supporting Inclusive Practices um, to start modeling some of our in-person workshops and how we can replicate those around the state. I'm going to, to another county office and I'm doing two of my in-person workshops, but I'm bringing all my slides and my notes with aud audio annotations there too, so they can observe it and they can put it into practice and they have questions. Then they don't have to spend all the time building it because a lot of these in-persons, I've done six or seven times, so they've been revised over time and they get better and better. So how can we save them all the effort that, that goes at? And they could take them and then they can make them even better. And then for cost, well, one thing we do is we put some stuff out for free, like that Padlet. But we try to cut through some of the noise and put things in one place. Our self-paced online course, we have tiered pricing for that. But what we did was we put it in 30-minute chunks. Each module takes 30, 45 minutes, which means a teacher can do it in their prep time or an early release time, which means you don't have to pay for a sub and you don't have to pay stipend, and you don't have to pay mileage. So it helps reduce the cost of training a lot of folks. For our moderated courses, you know, we're offering out that if a district wanted to train 20 people, well, you could just pay for a class, and we'll, we'll hire a moderator, and, and it really reduces the cost. And you know, we'd love to build out with our other county offices and, and other you know, big school districts. If you have a local expert in this, well, how do we make them a moderator? And then it reduces the cost. You know, if you have one in your own district, you know, the, what, how that's supported, if it's in their work day or whatever, you know, you'll have to figure out the cost. But you're not going to have to pay us for a moderator. You just supply your own. And then you have a local expert. It's not some guy in an office in, in L.A. that they haven't learned, it's, it, you know, they haven't met. It's, it's, some, it's somebody in their own school or their own district that they can talk to. Oh, we got a question? Uh, does L.A. County use DigiCoach to provide mastery-oriented feedback? Uh, I'm not aware, I, I know that Steve Dorsey and they're using it in, in, in our Division of Student Programs. Um, right now we're not using it out with, uh, within this model. What we use is we have, you know, I give people the options to submit a Google Doc or a Word Doc or they can scan something and just send it to me and then we do the feedback that way. But it'd be interesting to see how, the, if, I, I love working smarter not harder, so. So let's think about that variability. That's another one of those big heads, OK? So one of the variabilities we said was the role, right? We have different roles when it comes to implementation. So let's take a classroom teacher. And let's hope all my animations work. <laughs> so we give her the, the option to take training in person or online. And that online, it could be self-directed. 
They could just have access to the Padlet, because one of the great things on the Padlet is a great thing that comes from Cast, and it's a free ebook. I mean, you order this thing on Amazon, it's like 50 bucks, but you can get it for free and they can drive their own learning. So you could cert, you could have school-wide expectations, but you offer options in how they meet those expectations. We also have the self-paced course and the moderated course. Or if they want to go in person, we have a one-day awareness that we use with teachers called Teaching in the Margins, and then we have a two-day UDL boot camp that in incorporates collaborative lesson planning. So depending on how much they need and uh, how open they are to collaboration with other folks. And if they want to extend it afterwards, because we talked about, well, we had an in-person, what happens afterwards, they could always go back and say, well, now I want to do a self-paced course so I can go back and review, and I can do it in chunks. Because, you know, it was a great day, but it was a whole long day. You know, I, I watch teachers, they leave, and they're like, you know, this is how the kids feel every day, right? <laughs> so we give them options. And then at the school level, what if I'm a school and I want to implement? Well, like I said, we take a school leadership team and we talk about what types of folks should be on that leadership team. And then we lead them. What we've done so far is we led them through a planning year. And then in a pilot year, we trained uh, 10 people, coaches and teachers, and we provided the training. And then when they go to scale next year, they have the options. They can develop their own training. They can hire an outside trainer, they can work with any organization, or they could work with us, or a combination of that. That's not requisite to the program. They really need to be able to drive that. And now, well, what about at the, dis the district level? So we said, okay, this pilot's going well. How could we expand this to thinking about districts that want to do district level implementation? And a lot of this conversation came out of the MTSS work. We're working with all these districts on MTSS, and they say, okay, we want UDL to be our entry point. Okay, so what does that look like from a district perspective? And what do we have that could support that? So what we're doing is we're taking that blended model and saying now a prerequisite to going into that will be that you went through sums or another large scale. We have a, a wonderful PBIS team that's working with districts all across our county. And they've already gone in and done the work of creating an inclusive vision and doing an initiative inventory and looking at their teaming structures and looking at their resources and looking at how implementation is tied into the LCAP. So we don't spend a year doing that all over again, okay? That slows things down and it wastes people's time. We sp we're th so what we're designing is just to say, okay, how do we take that existing capacity and now apply it to a new initiative? And so they can take their schools and then they can train their pilots and then they can go to scale and do that starting in a two-year process. So by year two, they're going to scale and moving through scale and optimization and, and building for sustainability. But I might be the one lone nut at my school that wants to do this, so I'm over there. Or I might have a school district that's written in their LCAP and they want to do this, so this is where they go. Because we have to think about all those different needs. And then what we remind folks is, again, that this is a journey, not a destination. And so that's like looking at the, the PD that we do, it's constantly evolving. We're always looking at new ways we can do things. So I'll show, speaking of which, we just redid our website and I'll show you a little bit of where we are and what, how we sort of lay this out for districts and, or for, for anybody that comes to us. So this is our, oh, sorry, this is our website, uh, UDLA, and we have a little teaser video, and I'm proud of it, and it's very short, so I'm going to show it to you. Oh. I'm slider. Started, so we, my little teaser not to overwhelm folks, but make them quickly watch it.
And what we did was we started looking at, uh, at those different offerings, and I, sh I think about them in tiers, and not as tiers of instruction, you know, thinking this is what we're in, in our universal level in MTSS, but I think about tiers from our perspective as what do we have the capacity to support, okay? As one person or, you know, maybe a couple, what do I have the capacity to support? So for tier one is stuff that we can provide to an unlimited amount of folks. So we put in our Padlet and our automated course because we're not limited through capacity. The, our biggest limits on capacity is, is tech support for this because, um, and we're still learning and learning, but it's, it's, it's you know, how do we make things um, more uh, accessible and, and transparent for folks so we don't get the same questions over and over like, why do I need access to the California science test to do this? Or how do I get my password again? No. And so we have it and we, we that's our tier one. And then for tier two, we think about, okay, what do we have, you know, somewhat limited capacity. And so we have our in-person pieces and then we have our moderated courses and we've got a co-teaching model that's coming out in the spring. And and our in-person. So we think about that. What could we provide to, to folks uh, on a limited basis, but still a good, good amount of folks? And then for tier three is that, you know, there'll be even fewer people that want to do a whole school level implementation, okay? So that's what we think about as our tier three for a school or district. And, and of course, technical assistance, because that's really the highly individualized work. Um, and so that's how we, we organize our work and then we provide our, our frequently asked questions for folks. And that's, that is how to find us and, and uh, how we're trying to organize our, our multi-tiered system um, to support UDL implementation. But as I said, it's, it's a journey, so we're still building. And, and the lovely thing about pilots is we get all kinds of feedback from people. So I love my pilot coaches because they tell me, and they apologize, like, James, this didn't work. I'm sorry. I'm like, no, don't be sorry. Like, this is really helpful. It's very exciting to have them dig in there and, and let us know what's worked. You know, we've revised. I hate the fact that we have to put out estimated time of completion, but it's part of, you know, having a syllabus with UCLA because it's going to take the time it needs you to take. And people start making judgments about themselves if they go over the estimate. But some of the things we're building, um, we're taking our, our UDL boot camp, and, and when we go up to Sacramento for supporting inclusive practices, I'm bringing some of our, our Center for Distance and Online Learning, our Creative Impact team, and they're going to film it. And we're going to dice it up into sections and attach the slides and supports and you know, the, you know, break down the fourth wall. And then we're going to put it up for free on our website so that people could access it and recreate it in whatever pieces that they want to to do their own staff development. And so we're hoping that'll come out sometime next year. We're gonna tape in April, you know, chop it up, work on it through the summer, and hopefully in the fall we'll be able to put that out as a, as a free resource. Um, our wonderful uh, reading and English language arts consultant, Leslie Zoroy and I are, are collaborating on, on a couple online and in-person options around uh, this book for making Common Core writing standards accessible through universal design for learning. Thinking about all the variability that goes into that writing process, that, that many of them are invisible to, to teachers who, who maybe not thinking about those things. So how can we specifically support that in the area of writing? And then we're really looking for, for learning partners across the state. How can we work with with other county offices and districts, you know, how could you, how could we work to grow moderators so that there are local experts? How could we get more people to join our, our UDL online network so that we can share things? You know, I go to conferences like this and I hear somebody from some place, I mean, I told you I'm from Boston, there's a whole lot of places in California I've never even heard of. And, then, and I hear about the wonderful work they're doing. I said, well, why did I have to come all the way up here to find out? Okay, so how can we get more of us connected? And because and, it's really going to take a network of folks working together to, to drive this across the state. And I don't think there's any argument that it's important and it's necessary. The big challenge is how to do it. So once again, this is, this is our home, udla.laco.edu. Um, it's been my great pleasure to present to you. Um, 
you know, this is the first time I'm doing this, and I said I'm supposed to do 90 minutes, but it's going to take what it's going to take. <laughs> so it looks, looks like this is what it took. Um, but I, you know, I'm happy to take questions. Oops. Have you partnered with any schools of education in California? Have we, par uh, have we partnered with any schools of education? Not yet. I mean, we're running things through UCLA. I have had some conversations with some, uh, uh, some peers at, at USC, but we, we were thinking now more and more with the emphasis from the Higher Education Opportunity Act. In the past, our Center for Distance for Online Learning has provided modules to the Cal States around student mental health and suicide awareness and things like that. So how could we look at that and say, how can we share what we're doing with the teacher preparation programs? So that's definitely a, an avenue that we'd like to pursue. Come on. When you guys have been setting up these teams, what kind of people have been on your planning teams? And For like the site leadership the teams? Tier. Yeah, the site okay. leadership teams. So we definitely want at least one administrator. You know, and sometimes at a school there is only one administrator. Okay, if there is a site or a district coach, we like to bring them involved. And sometimes that's the administrator too. But these are, we think about the roles that we want filled. So who's coming from the, the managerial role? Who is coming from the, the support, the coaching role? And then we think about, you know, we, we advise, well, we want, you know, some involvement from your large stakeholder groups. So if you have a large uh, paraeducator group, who's a good stakeholder? It doesn't have to be the union president. Um, but who would be a good person to inform from that perspective? Because they're going to be involved with the implementation. Who are the good, you know, the teachers that need to be involved in that, that can come together? And that doesn't mean that's going to be everybody involved in the project. That's just the people that come to our meetings. You know, sometimes people are like, well, we want to bring 20 people. I said, well, that's not really facilitative in, in, in an environment. You know, the conversation breaks down. But that doesn't mean you can't share this with 20 people and work on it together and bring back the information. And then we think about, for our pilots, we think about, um, have, raise your hand if you've seen Simon Sinek's Start With Why. Okay. He does a great, uh, it's a great video, it's, it's one of the third most popular TED Talk, but he, one of the things he talks about is how you get movement spread. He think, talks about it from a business perspective, but he quotes an existing principle called the law of diffusion of innovation. And so what you really want are the people that you don't have to convince. Don't say, I want the teacher that's the hardest nut to crack. No, don't. That's a lofty goal, don't. Get the people that you don't have to convince, that believe what you believe and will be dying to go out there to try new things and fail and try again. Those are the people that you want to start. Because it's a great goal to want to get that one person, but what we see is if we can get everybody else, now it's not pressure from the top, it's not vertical, it's, it's peer pressure. Now there are more models to believe, maybe they just don't believe it coming from you, but now they're seeing from all their peers. And, get, and then also, let's take of it from like a, a, a secondary perspective. They get a, a student who says, uh, I can get more flexible instruction uh, in my other five classes, why can't I get it in here? And by the way, my mom wants to know too. Okay? So like any implementation, they'll, they'll get on or they'll move on. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. So, uh, just trying to understand this at a more kind of micro level, what would a, a UDL informed lesson plan look like as opposed to, like when a teacher is actually implementing it in their classroom, mm -hmm. what does that look like as opposed to just not having that? Okay, well, the, the, Katie Novak, the, the author, she says, the million dollar question is what does this look like? And the, and the frustrating answer is it depends. It depends on what we're teaching. It depends on to whom we're teaching. But what it could, one of the things it would look like, it was we'd have options for multiple ways for students to connect to the lesson, not just this is why this is important, but how it connects to me. And I could have supports for self-regulation so that they could monitor their own progress. I'd also have not just a sing uh, I'll tell you what it wouldn't like look like, one person just talking while everybody takes notes, you know, with no scaffolds. I used to joke that I, I could spot my high school history teacher, but only if he stood with his back to me. 
because I only saw the back of his head as he did this, okay? It could be options in how they express their learning. What's one of the, the biggest, the quickest entry points for teachers that I find is, how could I, like I, I default to social studies because that was my background, and say, uh, if I'm teaching uh, the four main, I'm assessing the four main, do they know the four main causes of World War I? And the default would be, or my default was, they're going to write a paragraph essay. But that's not the only way they can communicate that information. And I'm not necessarily having a writing standard as part of the goal of the lesson. So if it's not the goal of the lesson, why does it have to be the only way I assess? Because there are multiple ways they could do that. Okay, so start looking at, at th you know, it'd be a bunch of different pieces. You can look at, one of my favorite ones, is, which is really hard, uh, or it's really challenging, but you put in one bullet, is minimize threats and distractions. Well, that can look different on different days. What are the systems we have in place for kids that come in dis distress or that haven't eaten? Okay, what are the, what, you know, what does our school-wide behavior support look like? Or when I'm thinking about content, maybe I'm talking about something that could be very emotionally charged. How am I going to think about that in my lesson and, you know, and uh, prep students to deal with something that could be challenging rather than saying we're all talking about, you know, um, racism or, or violence at the border or whatever else you have, okay? Super great, love it. Uh, shameless plug, tomorrow that's what we're doing in the, in the next UDL session tomorrow is actually designing lessons, PD experiences, just, just a real basic ov like overview of that and then hopefully you'll have something, mm. but it was an, it'll be a nice follow up, so nice oh, job. Thank you, and the UDL progression rubric is great because what it does, it'll state, for an emerging teacher, this is what this could look like. And then for a proficient teacher, for each checkpoint, this is what this could look like. And then you can have a conversation with somebody about what might this look like in your classroom. I, I worked with our, our special education teachers that were working with students with you know, profound disabilities. And so we took the guidelines and said, what does this look like in your classroom? What would be evidence of implementation? Because people would walk and say they're not doing it. Well, do you even know what that could look like with that? with that population. And then once they figured it out and the admins got involved and they came to a mutual understanding, then they made these posters and stuck them up on the wall. So if anybody came in and we wanted to think about UDL from that perspective, it was up there. It says, this is what it looks like in my classroom or what it could look like. Over here. Just sort of piggybacking on what Zach said, just really good stuff and I would just add when you changed it to inclusive design um, adding intentional design right I, this is what this is all about and so I so appreciate the partnership with you and just learning everything that you guys are rolling out because it's so important across the state and, and as you're merging across the country but um, just really good stuff that that capacity building um, and then really the variability of each of the districts it applies so much and and the phrase cutting through the noise mm -hmm. I think that's what we really need on the ground um, because there's so much coming at educators all the time that you've done such a good job of intentionally designing how to meet the needs of all the learners and cut through the noise. Thank that you. Capacity. So I appreciate it. That's what we're trying. We're trying to, you know, walk the talk, you know, and intent. That's what UDL is about. It's not. Some people look at it's a form of differentiation. It's it's just doing it on the front end and less on the back end. And ev but even within an MTS framework, there's there's room for both. You know, that there are going to be times there's going to have to be specific differentiation happen. But we can predict a lot of variability ahead of time, regardless of who comes into our classroom and, and plan for it and, and support that instead of, you know, having failures and then figuring out what to do. We have a question here from the virtual site. Uh, can other districts access the self-paced online courses for purchasing? If so, who is the best person to contact? And if interested in participating, who do we contact? Okay, so if you go to UDLA, and I'm going to bring this up, if you go to udla.laco.edu, and then you go to our um, Tier 1 support, what we've done is we said, well, there might be a, a, a district that wants to do this or a school, and we started modeling out tiered pricing. and. So if you had one to twenty, and actually we have a promo code, so you can get it for a, for a hundred and forty bucks, and then we we knock the price down for more folks um, because it's, it cuts down our work because we can batch upload folks, and people can just email me at McKenna underscore James dot edu, 
or my secretary, Sandra Brown, and her contact on here as well. And that's in our FAQs. What if we wanted to do you know, multiple folks? Who could we contact? Sandra Brown, brown underscore Sandra at laco.edu. Um, And we have a bunch of sort of, again, and there's a, how do I find out more information? And there's her contact info. So, yeah. If that's it, uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. And uh, go Sox. <laughs>